Christian teachers become universalist. And it usually surrounds something along the lines of this. A loving God wouldn't do this. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. Lord, I pray that this message is a message that you got to have, have for your people, that the proud amongst us would be humbled, but the humble lifted up. And I pray that I would say no unwise word that would do shame to your name or harm to the hearers, but only that which is fitting to lift people up in your name. Amen. So uh, tonight I'm going to do something a little bit different. I had an experience. You know, I had just gotten back on vacation and I read an article uh, by, the, by R.V. Young entitled The Narrow Gate in Touchstone uh, Christian Journal. I get the ability to do a lot of reading when I'm on vacation. And that article brought back to my memory an experience that I had about a year and a half ago. About a year and a half ago, I went on a youth trip to an LCMS youth gathering with just LCMS Lutherans. If you don't know what LCMS stands for, it stands for Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. It's the particular denomination of which this church is a part, and uh, I, I would consider the pastors and our teaching to be biblical and conservative. So about a year and a half ago, we go to a youth trip in uh, the LCMS, and a lot of the kids were going to go to this one particular breakout session, and this breakout session was on the subject of hell. And so a lot of the kids were going, so I said, I'll go to this breakout session as well. And so I was listening to the teaching that was going on, and alarm bell after alarm bell was going off in my mind. And I was really disappointed uh, and, and honestly, uh, kind of shocked at what was being said. He didn't outright say it, but he certainly gave the impression that hell might be real, but nobody's in it. Nobody's in it. He was teaching something called universalism. Universalism is the belief that in one way or another, whether immediate or either after time in some kind of purgatory, eventually all people succumb to divine love and are forgiven their sins and will spend eternity in heavenly glory. Now, universalism can take many forms. Some people who are universalists will say basically all religions are the same and it doesn't matter what you believe, God's going to save everybody. To be fair, that's not what he was saying. He was saying that everyone is going to be saved through Jesus, whether they know it or not. And even after death, you know, who knows what's going to happen between now and the resurrection, but by the time the resurrection takes place, everybody's going to believe in Jesus. So in, in that way, he can get away with saying, do you have to believe in Jesus? Yes. But what he was saying is, one way or another, everybody's going to what? believe in Jesus. That was his form of universalism. And I had very long discussions with him afterwards. And I talked with him a lot afterwards. One of our systematic works entitled Christian Dogmatics from Francis Pieper writes this. Holy Scripture teaches the truth of an eternal damnation so clearly and emphatically that one cannot deny it without at the same time rejecting the authority of Scripture. Scripture parallels the eternal salvation of the believers and the eternal damnation of the unbelievers. Whoever therefore denies the one must, to be consistent, deny the other. In our very own Augsburg Confession, it reads, we confess that at the consummation of the world, that means at the end of this time-space continuum, Christ will appear and raise all the dead granting eternal life and eternal joys to the godly, but condemning the ungodly to endless torment with the devil. These are things that we subscribe to. 
as Lutheran Church, Missouri sent pastors. So the reason I was so upset was I'm used to hearing universalism from where? From the world. Very unused to it in what I consider to be a safe location where we would go. Now, thankfully, our children were lollygagging in there and pretty much heard nothing, but I did. <laughs> and, and, and I heard what was going on. Far more persuasive than our doctrinal stances is the scripture itself. I'm going to give a smattering of scriptures on this topic. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is where universalists will stop. But Jesus also spoke, verse 18, whoever believes it in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Whoever, John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Jesus speaking in John 5, talking about the resurrection. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. And come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. Revelation 20. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Matthew 18, 8, and if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. Matthew 13, this is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it uh, unto one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The, there's plenty I could have cho chosen. The great majority of these, if you notice, was spoken by who? Jesus himself. It's such a repeatable, it's not obscure. The church fathers taught eternal life and eternal damnation. For millennia, the church universe, this was not something we argued about. We argued about a lot of stuff. We argued about who should be baptized. We argued about the nature of the Lord's Supper. We even argued about the nature of salvation. But you know what we never really argued about? That there's a heaven and a hell. But now, we are being inundated with this idea of universalism. Everyone eventually gets saved. When I spoke with this man, and I think that you've all... Well, I shouldn't say you. I'll bet you you've had conversations like this with some of your unbelieving friends. Hell is not a pleasant doctrine. Eternal damnation is not a pleasant doctrine. And it's one of the biggest stumbling blocks for unbelieving people. They'll say things like, so what you're trying to tell me is that God is going to cast me into hell just because 
of my sexuality or us having sex outside of marriage. Is that what you're trying to tell me? Are you trying to tell me that God is going to cast me into hell just for not going to church on Sunday? Are you trying to tell me that God, I, no matter what my child has done, I would never consign my child to eternal damnation and eternal punishment. And you're trying to tell me that God is a loving God and he casts people into eternal damnation. Doesn't make sense to me. And it's because of those arguments that some Christian teachers, sadly many, as a matter of fact, in America today, I'll say most, Christian teachers become universalist. And it usually surrounds something along the lines of this. A loving God wouldn't do this. God's love overpowers everything, and God's love overpowers all this unbelief. God cannot be loving and consign people to hell forever. He just can't. And that was basically this man's position that I spoke to. This is basically the position of most quasi-Christian teachers who would teach universalism. That's basically what they're saying. The problem, of course, comes down to this. Your knowledge is only as good as your source information. I'm going to say that again because it's really, really, really important. Your knowledge, what you believe to be true, is only as good as your source information. For example, I, let, let's pick a subject matter. How far away, uh, what's the speed of light? Does anybody know the speed of light? I'll pick something out. What's the speed of light? 186,000 miles per second? Okay, that was a bad example because I can't even repeat the truth. All right. It's really fast. Like 186,000 to the 10th power. It's fast, man. It's fast. Okay. I believe that. What's my source of that? Like, I've done no measurements, right? I've done no measurements of the speed of light. Like, how far away is the sun? Isn't it like 96 million miles away or something like that? 96 miles. I believe that. But I've done no measurements of that. My source is what I've been told, right? Okay, so I believe my source is Scott. That's right. I don't think that's going to go with what I'm about to say. Yeah? Like, I, like your source has to be good. You know what I mean? I, 90, I'm going to make up a statistic. 90 to 95% of what you believe, you believe based on authority. Meaning you didn't do the research. You didn't do the testing. You were informed of a thing. It comported with what you thought might be true, and you believe it. Okay? 90 to 95% of what you believe to be true is based because some authority that you trust told you. Now, who is the authority in that sentence? A loving God wouldn't do this. God's love overpowers everything, and God's love overpowers all this unbelief. God cannot be loving and consign people to hell forever. He just can't. Who's the authority in that sentence? The person's reason. What they're doing, and they don't know that they're doing it, is they're taking how they think, how they feel, how they believe, and putting that and saying, God thinks the way what? I think. The authority in that sentence is not God. The authority in this paragraph is not the Scripture. The authority in this paragraph is my personal understanding of love. And I think that's actually a very, very, very important thing to recognize. This is an individual trying to put God in their box. Instead of having their minds, their thoughts, their feelings conformed to God's box. I just showed you all the scriptures. You simply can't deny them. They're so obvious. They're so plain. I could go on and on and on. Scripture after scripture after scripture. It's so written on every page of the Bible that there is a heaven and there, there is a hell and that Jesus is the only way to salvation and you have to believe in him. And after you die, there's nothing but judgment. 
It's repeated time and time and time again. You might even say, how could anyone actually read the Bible and be a universalist? And the answer is, they're not taking the Bible as the authority. They're taking them as the authority. Remember, everything we believe is almost entirely based on authority. What they're doing, and they don't mean to do it, is they're making themselves the authority. Isaiah 55, 9, a very popular section of Scripture. God is declaring this about himself. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways. By the way, heaven's higher than the earth. How high are the heavens? You can't measure it. So are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. What he's saying here is, you don't think like who? Me. You don't think like me. And I don't think like you. That's what he's saying. God's ways are not my ways. And the goal, the hope, is not that God can think like me. You want to know how you can tell man-made religion? If it all made sense to men. You've made a God in your image. He thinks just like me. It's amazing. He approves of everything I do. He rationalizes what I rationalize. He says what I already believe. But according to the Bible, the real God is higher than the heavens. His ways are not our ways and His thoughts are not our thoughts. The goal is not that God would be conformed to the way that I think. The goal is I would be conformed what? To the way that He thinks. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16 is very instructive on this point. The natural person. When the Bible talks about the natural person, what kind of person is, is it talking about? Unregenerate. Unbelieving. Uh, what a person is by their very nature. Do human beings have reason by their nature? Yes or no? Yeah, we have reason. Do we have a will? Yeah. Like unbelieving people, you know unbelieving people, they have a reason, they have a will, they have emotions, they have the desires, right? Okay, that, that's what the Bible means by the natural person. The natural person, what you are by your very nature, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to Him. Are you trying to tell me that God would send me to hell just because I don't obey Him? That's foolishness to the unbelieving world. That's not how I would behave. As if God, His ways, make no mistake, remember this, always remember this. God condemned humanity to death because of one act of disobedience. It wasn't even close to sexual immorality. Okay? One act of disobedience, God consigned the entire creation to what end? Death. It's that simple. <clears throat> it is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The natural person cannot understand the things of God because the things of God can only be understood when you possess the Holy Spirit. The spiritual person, verse 15, as opposed to the natural person. In the Bible, a spiritual person is anyone that possesses the Holy Spirit. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord as to instruct him? Basically, you don't get to tell God what? What to do and how to think. But he has given us the mind of Christ. The believer, he is conforming the way we think to the way he thinks. He conforms us. We do not conform him. And so when the Bible makes a repeatable... See, I try actually really hard to preach on what I'll call God's repeatables. I don't pick obscure verses to preach on. I preach on that which is repetitive. That he says over and over and over and over again. That it should be so obvious to anyone that reads it. That we are conformed to him. He is not conformed to us. And what the scripture clearly teaches are these simple principles. 
They're simple to know, but hard to deal with. We're born sinners under the wrath of God. God still loves us and desires us to be reconciled to Him. God sent His Son to live for us, to die for us, and rise again for us so that we might be restored to Him. All who trust Christ are restored to God, and all who do not remain under God's wrath for eternity. That's what the Bible declares. God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to save you. But the Bible makes it very clear that you must repent of your sins and acknowledge Jesus Christ in order to be saved. The entire book of Acts would make no sense. If everyone got saved, now I want to be fair to some universalists. They would say, Jesus, it was still necessary to live a sinless life. It was still necessary for him to die for sin. It was still necessary for him to rise again. But if you didn't have to believe it, why tell anyone about Jesus? Do you hear my question? If the idea was that by Jesus performing what he did, the whole world would be saved, what's the point of missionary work? It doesn't make any sense. Why tell anybody about Jesus? In the end, they're all what? Going to be saved by him? You don't got to say nothing. He'll eventually, apparently, overpower their unbelief and wickedness and give them faith. So why say anything? Why be uncomfortable at work? Why be uncomfortable at the Thanksgiving Day table? Why even tell anybody about Jesus? Jesus will take care of that. The, the Great Commission doesn't even make sense. Go and make disciples of all nations. Why, Jesus? You're going to make disciples out of everybody, no matter what we do. So why do I got to do nothing? If it's true that eventually... Everybody, what? Get saved. As a matter of fact, it's so central, the whole Bible doesn't make sense at that point. They've given up the entire thing. There is no evidence in the Bible that humanity after death gets a second shot. As a matter of fact, quite the opposite. Imagine Revelation 20, 13 to 15, and try and read that as a universalist. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the death that were in them. They were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. What's the point of verse 16? If there isn't anybody whose name would not be written, where? It doesn't even make sense. Revelation 21, verse 7 and 8. The one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God. He will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. What is the point of verse 8 if in the end there is none of those people? Or is it written as a warning to those people? To tell them what their future will be like if they do not repent and believe the gospel. Now, I'm not saying all this because I enjoy the doctrine of hell. As a matter of fact, I hate it. Uh, I shouldn't have said that. I love everything that God does. I wish it wouldn't, wouldn't be true, so I strike that. Does that make sense? God, I think, hates the fact that there must be a hell. Okay? I say this not because I find enjoyment in it. I say it because it's true. Why am I not a universalist? Because it ain't so. And I don't believe that telling people what isn't true will help them in the end. So it becomes cosmically essential that we speak the truth. And here's the truth. Everybody is condemned to eternal damnation. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to save us, to live for us, to die for us, to rise again for us, to save us from this damnation. He calls us to repentance and faith. But if we stubbornly will not believe in him, he finally gives us exactly what we want, which is life without him. And life without him is eternal torment. 
So that's the truth. And that should be the motivator for every single one of us. There really is a heaven. A heaven so wonderful. No more weeping. No more mourning. No more pain. No more death. A heaven so wonderful that I want everyone to experience it. But there's also a, a, a hell where you are thirsty but cannot drink, where you are hungry but you cannot eat, where you're surrounded with people but you're completely isolated and alone, where you are tired but there is no sleep for eternity. So bad that I want no one to experience it. So that motivates me to do what? Tell the world about Jesus Christ. To tell the world that there is a Savior and salvation in Jesus alone. I remember sitting down with this universalist talking about, and I will say, I think this is, uh, if not the one of the, it's, it's definitely top three experiences in my ministry. I've shared it in Bible study. I don't remember how I've shared it in worship, but I thought it was fitting uh, for this particular sermon, and I'll end with this story. Marty Arshment, I asked her permission. She said I could share the story. Marty Arsman is a faithful woman of God, a member of our congregation. She's married right now to Ray, who is undergoing cancer treatment. We consistently pray for Ray. Amen? Amen. Well, Marty had a brother who's unbaptized. The rest of the family was baptized. Marty's brother denied Christ his entire life. His name was John Vernon. And I was sitting in my office, and Marty called me. And she said, Pastor, with tears, you can hear the tears over the phone. My brother John is in the hospital, and he's going to die. He's unbaptized. He doesn't believe in the Lord. Will you go talk to him? Stop the story for a minute. Why would Marty call me crying for me to go see her dying brother? What's... What's under that phone call? What, what's, what's she believing? My brother's going to die and go to hell. And I'm really concerned about that. So I'm going to call Preacher Man in the hopes that Preacher Man can be used by God to do something. I say to Marty, I will go see him. Why am I going to go see a dude that I've never seen a day in my life? Why do I care? Why? I'm a busy dude. Why am I going to interrupt my day that day, cancel appointments to go up to the hospital to go see dying dude? What, what's undergirding me doing that? I don't want John to go to hell. I want him to experience grace, forgiveness, mercy. I'm not worried about John changing his ways on earth. Chapter <laughs> What's, what's going to happen to John? See, one of the universalists always say is, I want to be careful because I really don't want to be mocking. What they'll say is, well, it's helpful to tell people about Jesus so that they'll be better people. Well, John's dead. Who cares if John's a better person? He's like going to die in a day or so. Right? So why didn't I just tell Marty? It don't matter. John will be fine. But I didn't. Cancel the appointments, go up to the hospital. And I stand outside his door. A nurse was attending to John. John was on oxygen, but he was mentally cognizant and aware. But he was on... <sighs> you follow? So the nurse does what she's going to do. She leaves. And I, and I walk in the room and I say, Hi, John. My name is Pastor Chris. Your sister Marty asked me to come see you. The first thing out of his mouth was blasphemy. And I can't say the word. But he just said, mm -mm -mm. I told her I don't want to see no mm -mm 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 preacher. Okay. I'll never forget it. He's sitting in the hospital, mask. <laughs> and he's just cursed me out, blasphemed. So I looked at John. I said, John, I'm going to respect you. And I'll leave. But I just want you to know this. You're going to die and go to hell. You're going to be tormented for eternity. I am here to tell you how to escape the wrath of God where you will be tormented day and night under his punishment because of the wickedness that is in you. If you want me to go, I'll go. 
but just understand you're going to hell. And John said, you can sit down. <laughs> so I sat down. <laughs> I mean, so he said, John, what's the problem? Why don't you believe in God? And he brought up a bunch of points. Raped girls in the world. Cancer children. Starving people. And I said, John, you don't care about raped girls, cancer children, starving people. You really care about them right now while you're dying in a hospital bed? That's just an excuse. The fact of the matter is you're afraid. You've been blaspheming God your entire life. And you're afraid that when you die, he might be real. So you're trying to convince yourself he's not real. But I'm here to tell you he's very real. And when you close your eyes, you're going to meet him face to face. Whether you deny him or not, you will meet him. And you will see that God is real. So let's stop playing games, John. You don't care about raped children. You don't care about cancer children. And you don't care about wars and starving children in Africa. You just don't want there to be a God, but there is one. And he exists. And you're under his wrath. Would you like me to tell you what you need to do to be forgiven? He began to tear up. And he said, yes. And he said, it's time to acknowledge all the nastiness that you are, John. And it's time to admit how guilty you really are. It's time to ask him for forgiveness and believe in his son, Jesus Christ. So I was able to pray with John, and I filled up a Dixie cup with water, and I baptized John in the hospital bed, and he died the very next day. And then I officiated his funeral at the funeral home, and the entire family was in tears. They'd been praying their whole lives that John would just come to faith. And it was wonderful to witness a man who was this close to hell be completely and totally forgiven and restored for a wicked, pointless life and be welcomed into heavenly glory. Imagine if Marty was a universalist. Imagine if I was a universalist. See, if you were to ask me, I am by nature a lazy dude. I am by nature a settler. This is true about me. I need people around me to push me. And so God puts people around me that push me. Like Beth. <laughs> uh, so, I need to be told uh, what's best. The best practices. And I get irritated sometimes because I'm naturally a settler. Now, a lot of people would not say that about me. What I need you to know is that the only thing that drives me, and it drives me to the bone, I seek no grandeur. I seek no acknowledgement from the world. I just want to live a nice, happy life, die in obscurity, and go to heaven. That's what I want. That's what Chris wants. What drives me is that. There's a heaven. And there's a hell. And God has placed me here to be an ambassador for him. And I really care if people go there. And it drives almost every single thing I do in life, is that reality. Do you really think I love knocking on doors? Do you really think that, that, that at, at base, Chris loves going to the fair, getting all sweaty and filled with dirt? Do you really think that I love having those uncomfortable conversations where people get upset with me? Do you really think that I like to have those conversations with people that are my friends that, and they're going to be upset? Do you really think I like that? No, I hate every moment of that. The, the natural Chris does. But I'm overwhelmed by this reality. It's overwhelming to me. It's shockingly overwhelming. We're not talking about 100 years. 
We're not talking about 200 years. We're not talking about 500 years. We're not talking about 1,000 years. We're talking about eternity. And in comparison to eternity, what is 90 or 100 years on this earth? Nothing. That's why it's so irritating to me when people in the twilight of their life say things like this, I just want to... I just want to rest. I get it. Chris has been wanting to rest his whole life. I just want some me time. I get it, man. Chris has wanted me time his whole life. I just want to relax and spend some time by myself and just be alone. I get it, man. I get it. Here's the problem. Your life ain't about you. Your life ain't about your rest. Your life ain't about your little vacations. Your life ain't about going where you want to go. Your life is about there is a heaven and there is a hell. And you're here because Jesus has called you here. And he wants you to tell the world about his son. That's why you exist. That's why you're here. So stop wishing for some magical period of time Will you finally get it for myself? Man, just stop. I'll tell you when you're going to get some me time. When you're dead. And you get to go to heaven. No more weeping, mourning, pain, or death. That's when me time comes. But now, while it's day, is the time for work. And it's time to tell the world about Jesus. Because we're not dealing with trifling, simple things. We're dealing with eternity. And it's about time we took it seriously. Amen. Amen. God is good. All the time. time. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again. We thank you, Lord, that there is a heaven. That there's a resurrection. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you have saved us. Thank you. We don't deserve it. But Father, forgive us for not realizing that there's an ancillary to that and an opposite. And that people are dying every day and going to hell. And that we should really care about that a lot. Help us, Father. Speak the truth. Speak it in love. And tell the world about a loving Savior died and rose again for them in your name. Amen.